Welcome to this special edition of Talk Africa. Well, it has been a riveting week in South Africa. Judge Tokozile Masipa found Oscar Pistorius, South Africa's double amputee star athlete, guilty of culpable homicide. She acquitted him of murder charges for shooting to death his 29-year-old supermodel girlfriend, Riva Steenkamp, in the early hours of Valentine's Day last year. The verdict was the culmination of a closely watched drama and transfixed a global audience. Guy Henderson closely followed the proceedings and tells us more. For this final walk to court, the accused and the watching world were already all but certain which judgment would come. Mr. Pistorius, please stand up. Now the judge has spelled it out. On count one, the charge of murder. The accused is found not guilty and is discharged. Instead, he is found guilty of culpable homicide. In front of the cameras, Riva Stienkamp's family gave only the faintest reaction. They may find this hard to stomach. On the other three charges, guilt on just one of them, unlawfully firing a gun in a restaurant. He may not have intentionally pulled the trigger. However, that in itself does not absolve him of the crime of neg negligently handling a firearm in circumstances where it creates a risk to the safety of people and property and not to take reasonable precautions to avoid the danger. As court adjourned, Oscar Bastorius left almost overwhelmed by the heaving mass. His bail has been extended until sentencing in a few weeks' time. But if the last 19 months has been a nightmare, the path ahead could be almost as hard. Well, there's no final closure here because this verdict is stoking controversy, with some legal minds claiming the judge has misinterpreted the law. If that's the case, there could be grounds for appeal. Prosecutors still maintain they feel they had the evidence to put the athlete behind bars for life. When we take matters to court, it's always because we believe that there is credible and sufficient evidence on the charges that would have preferred against that particular individual. So we believed in this instance that there was sufficient and credible evidence to secure a conviction on the premeditated murder in, um, in, the, in the course of justice. No comment from the athlete. That was left to his uncle. A tragic event like, like this, uh, there's, there's no victors in this. We, re, we, we, rem, we as a family remain deeply infected by, by the devastating tragedy event. And, and it won't bring River back, but our hearts still go out for her family and friends. A month now for both families to digest the drama of the last two days. This very public ordeal may nearly be over, but it's not quite. Guy Henderson, CCTV, Pretoria, South Africa. Well, Oscar Pistorius will remain on bail until his sentence in a month's time on October the 13th. There is no doubt that the outcome of this case will reverberate across South Africa and indeed the rest of the continent for quite some time. Now, Oscar Pistorius' trial has raised questions across the continent about how Africa deals with the sensitive issue of gender-based violence. My guest today, Florence Jaoko, will give us some insights into that in a moment. But first, CCTV's Dan Williams in a special from Johannesburg with more on this unfolding drama. Dan? Yes, thanks very much. Yes, it's been a dramatic few days at the North Hauteng High Court as Judge Masipa delivered her verdict in the Oscar Pistorius trial. Uh, no shortage of emotion, no shortage of tears, but plenty of confusion and questions as well. And to try and make sense of it all, I'm joined by our legal expert, Michael Motsaneng Bill. Uh, Michael, thanks very much for coming to join us. Good to be here, Dan. Oscar Pistorius, he's been convicted of culpable homicide and one of the other lesser firearm charges as well. What's your immediate reaction to that? When I first sensed that the, that the first two possible charges of murder have been ruled out, I was very surprised because I did expect at the very least that the state had succeeded in proving dolus eventualis. 
and at least uh, intention in the form of Douglas Eventualis, and for that reason, he ought to have been convicted for murder. Not premeditated murder, but just a normal, ordinary kind of murder. So it took me as a big, uh, for, as a big surprise when I, when, I, when, I, when I saw that she was leaning towards culpable homicide. So very big surprise from me, but also most of my peers are also very surprised by this. But you know, that, us being surprised does not make that ruling wrong. It just means that it's we surprised, and I think the question now is: Will you know if it goes uh, to appeal, and the proper people who are vested with judging this judge, whether they would agree with us or they would lean towards the direction taken by the judge? To try and put it more plainly, Dolores Eventualis, just explain that a little bit, uh, and just explain why many people do think, though, it, it, in a bit more detail, as to why uh, many people do feel that perhaps Judge Masipa did get this wrong. Yeah, you know, dolus eventualis, what it simply means, and I think the best way to explain it is by way of example. If I burn grass, dry grass, and my primary objective is to burn the grass, but I could see that a few meters down the line, there is a car, and I foresee that there's a chance that in me setting the grass alight, I might also set the car alight. But my intention is not to set the car alight. But despite that I foresee this possibility, I reconcile myself to this possibility and proceed to set the grass alight. As a consequence, not only the grass burns, but also the car. So the argument there is dolus eventualis is, is, is established because even though I didn't have the intention to burn the car, we, the, the, we found the intention using constructive measures. So constructive, almost like a constructive intention. And, and, and that is done by way of saying it's dolus eventualis because you foresaw this possibility and you nevertheless uh, reconciled yourself to it and proceeded. Why did you, though, use that for the culpable homicide charge and also uh, the fact that Pistorius knew he, uh, how to use a gun, he'd had training uh, for, the for the lesser firearm charge too, but she didn't apply it for that, uh, that straight murder charge. But, and and that's, where, that's why we're all so confused, because when you say somebody is, uh, is guilty of culpable homicide, or as they call it in other jurisdictions, manslaughter, you're saying that somebody was negligent. Now, for you to have been negligent, it, it, you, you can't have, you know, you can't be negligent if you hear, hear a sound, arm yourself, approach the danger. When you get to the danger, fire four shots into a small little cubicle and be said to, to have been negligent. Quite clearly, the intention to shoot at the, the potential danger that was in that cubicle was established. So th that was, the intention is there. Now, the only issue that I think you know, the, the judge might be struggling with, or at least I'm struggling to understand from the judge's verdict today, is she places great emphasis on the identity of the person that was eventually shot. And she's saying, uh, Oscar Pistorius did not intend to shoot and kill Riva Steenkamp. He intended to kill an intruder. And, and, and for me, that's too much emphasis being placed on the personality, because that's not the inquiry. The inquiry is, when you fired the four shot, did you foresee that a human being would be killed as a result? Now, of course, a few days ago, Oscar Pistorius faced a, a premeditated murder charge. Um, what do you feel was the main plank uh, for Judge Masipa in, in dismissing that and coming to her conclusion? Well, the premeditated charge was always a long shot, but I think it's good for the state to have done that because you want to aim very high. And when you aim that high, it means you give the judge an opportunity to, to go to scale down. And, and unfortunately, she scaled all the way down to culpable homicide. But if you're not successful with premeditated murder, then you would have just a normal murder, which, which attracts a sentence of 15 years. So that's what you'd be sitting with. And, and so it's a good strategy to start high or aim high. Failing that, then you, you would be looking at the next best thing, which is, which is murder. The MPA, the National Prosecuting Authority, uh, they're keeping their options open, potential for appeal. You touched on it earlier. Do you feel that there would be some success there for them? I, I, I do. I do. You know, because, because the, the NPA can appeal a matter. I mean, it, it's not every day where the NPA appeals matters because they, their attitude is normally, if, the, if a ruling has been made, you move on to the next case because there are quite a number of cases to focus on. But if there is an error and then that error does not pertain to a question of fact. 
it pertains to a question of law, as, as does this case, because this case is not whether she interpreted the screams well or, or didn't interpret some fact that was tendered. It's a legal question. Has dolus eventualis been established? Do, do we have the requirements for a dolus eventualis? And how you interpret dolus eventualis is a legal question, and, and that would entitle the NPA or the National Prosecuting Authority to bring forth an appeal. What kind of process would we be would be talking about? I'm, I'm assuming that would take uh, a, a number of years. And, and, and how would that process uh, go through? Well, what they'd have to do is after the sentence has been has been rendered, because they can't appeal now, because you know they, you, 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 an appeal is typically based on two things. You can appeal against a sentence and a conviction, so you can have two two grounds of appeal. So you want to wait until the sentence has been rendered. And what they can do then is immediately after the sentence is passed, they can give their notice to the the notice to appeal or leave to appeal and Judge Masipa can grant the leave to appeal or refuse it. If she refuses it, then the, the prosecution can petition the judge president uh, who would then decide on whether the petition should be permitted or not. And if, if, if he agrees and he permits the appeal, then the matter would be heard by three judges and, and that, that would be the appeal process. Kerry now was confident in his case, the prosec prosecution authority were confident in the case. Did they go wrong at all? Not in my assessment. In fact, if, if when I looked at this, I, I, thought, I thought, if you compared the, 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 the litigators in this matter, when you take Kherinel on the one hand, or not even Kherinel, because he did have a team, a good team at, at that, um, he, they did a good job. I can't fault anything that they've done, because they also had to work with the facts that they had. The people who I thought were disappointing are the defense. But despite my views, they managed to secure a rather favorable uh, judgment. So, so, so they were dis disappointing in a variety of, of, of aspects. The first thing that I found disappointing about the defense is the fact that they made promises about us going to hear some witnesses who are going to talk to us about screams. Uh, so, and that, that promise was not kept. We never heard a witness who came to testify about the screams. In fact, we never heard Oscar Pistorius himself um, uh, uh, demonstrate how he screams like a woman. So that was quite disappointing. And, and, and despite that error or despite that blunder, they still managed to, 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 to succeed. So, 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 and, and also some of the witnesses that they called. Um, every single witness that you bring must have some strategic purpose to the end result that you want to achieve. We had a social worker that was brought in, um, and all she came in and told us about is how much Oscar Pistorius was screaming. That, no value was added by that. Because, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if, if somebody is shot and killed somebody and they didn't intend to kill that person um, from a, from a non-legal point of view. They could be devastated and they could be emotional and they could be crying. But that doesn't really talk to whether or not they're guilty. Talking of some of the witnesses, some of the ear witnesses or eye witnesses, uh, they came in for some, I wouldn't say criticism, the judge said that they were mistaken. But do you feel this puts a question mark over the potential of further, in, in future cases, witnesses coming forward if they hear or, or see something? Yeah, you know, the justice system does depend on people coming forth and giving evidence. But the, obviously, these witnesses in this case were not, were not ambiguous about their views uh, in as far as saying that they found this process to be taxing on them. And if they could choose again, they would probably not come and give the, the evidence that they'd get, that, that given because it was a traumatic experience for them. But, but I mean, that's, that's, in my view, an irresponsible approach because when it's them, on the other hand, who need a witness, when, when the crime has happened to them and they need a witness, they would like some other person to sacrifice themselves as they did and, and, and assist in the administration of justice. So whilst I am sympathetic to the taxing nature of any criminal proceedings, it's taxing on the witnesses, it is taxing even on the lawyers. You know, by the time lawyers finish cases like this, they need a holiday because it is taxing. If it's taxing on a lawyer, it is even more taxing on a witness but even more taxing on the accused person. The ANC Women's League have used this trial in, in order to promote, which is uh, a, a key issue for South Africa, and that is domestic violence. Now, I'm not talking about the Oscar Pistorius trial at, at this stage, but do you feel the way that perhaps the legal system has handled domestic violence in a very public way, uh, do you feel that perhaps uh, victims, other victims, will be perhaps discouraged uh, to come forward uh, because it's a he says, she says, and, uh, and, and sometimes it's, it, it, well, it, it certainly raises a question mark, doesn't it? Yeah, but I think, I think they, you know, there's no reason for anybody to be discouraged from coming forth because all of us are now, now know who and what Oscar is. Um, and the bottom line is Oscar has been convicted. 
you know, so, so the, it's, not a, it's not the best result that everybody would have hoped for or, or the general victim uh, of, of domestic violence would have hoped for, but certainly uh, he was not acquitted. Um, and and, and if, somebody, if somebody's convicted for culpable homicide or manslaughter, that means they, do, uh, they are in jeopardy of, of facing some jail, some jail term. At the very least, they have a criminal record against their name. So meaning that the next time they encounter the law, they're not going to be treated as a first-time offender. They're going to be treated as somebody who's been previously convicted before. And as you'd have heard today when they're talking about the bail, the bail application, it was a material question whether or not there was a previous conviction. And just very briefly, if there was a jury system as opposed to a judge, do you feel that we would have had a different result potentially? Yeah, if we had a jury system, we'd, we'd have unmanageable results. And, and, and what our system lends itself to is predictability and, and certainty. And, and, and so when you look at this judgment, there's, there's zero emotion in it. The only critique that is advanced against the judgment is one of whether the judge had erred in applying the principles of law. And, 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 and that's, a, that's a good debate that you want to have. You don't want to have, you, don't want to have, you know, with other, with other jurisdictions, you find that people's prejudices affect how they, they, they decide on matters. You know, a, a woman who was formerly abused by, by her husband or boyfriend would not acquit Oscar Pistorius. She would find it very difficult to acquit Oscar Pistorius because she brings that into, into the courtroom. Um, a man who's abused women would, very, would find it very difficult to convict Oscar Pistorius. So we're leaving out all of these personal factors. Of course, I'm not saying that judges are immune from those personal circumstances or factors, but because they administer justice every day, they, 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 it's, it's impossible for them to not have mastered the art of divorcing their personal views on the matter because if you're dealing with a hundred domestic violence cases in five years it's unlikely that you'll convict all of them because you had previously uh, been been a victim yourself michael thank you very much for your time uh, very interesting points made there uh, and i'm sure you'll uh, agree that uh, the discussion around this will continue for some time to come of course sentencing takes place next month back to you all right dan a dramatic trial a dramatic week indeed down there in South Africa. We'll take a short break now and return with more from my guest here in studio, Florence Joko, former chair of the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights. Do stay tuned. Four shots at the door. It was an accident. Welcome back to the program. Now, gender violence is a silent but overarching societal crisis that transcends class barriers. In Africa, it receives very little, if any, social and legal attention. So, what impact will the outcome of the Pistorius trial have for gender violence in countries on the continent? Well, joining me now to discuss this issue is Florence Jauko, a human rights lawyer. Florence, welcome to the program. Oscar Pistorius has been found guilty of culpable homicide. Now, on a continent that many countries have a rather high level of uh, high rates of uh, domestic violence, what went through your mind? I think that one of the things that went through my mind was just asking myself whether is it because Oscar is uh, this elite South African who is very a celebrity so to say and, and I wondered if this would be the same if uh, Oscar was somebody living in the slums of South Africa and had murdered their wives and chances are that they probably would be similar outcomes uh, because in a lot of uh, domestic violence cases the evidence is uh, you know it's what he says what she says and uh, especially in such a case where, you know, the victim has died. So you don't actually even get to know what the victim has to say. All right. And it's very, uh, I think it's, it's, very, it's very pathetic. 
that uh, this ends up with people dying, that they did not speak before they died. In South Africa, though, uh, we get statistics like a woman is killed by domestic violence on average every eight hours, a rate that is five times higher than the global average. But in other African countries as well, I mean, we get statistics like uh, half or more women have experienced physical and sexual violence in their lifetimes. If we can broaden this a bit about Africa, though, how widespread is domestic violence? Well, I think from the statistics that you've quoted, obviously in Africa, domestic violence or even just violence against women, uh, because there's domestic violence, but there's also sexual violence that occurs to women, and it could be by total strangers, it could be by persons that they know. And I think that it is very widespread because women are more vulnerable, uh, and uh, a lot of times the security systems don't work for women. So they are more likely to be exposed to violence or to be exposed to violent uh, crime. So I think for Africa, it's a very, very serious issue. And there are a number of uh, um, uh, mechanisms that could deal with violence. First of all, at the domestic level, a lot of African countries have penal laws that deal with uh, uh, you know, criminality, but not many of them are very particular and specific on domestic violence or sexual violence. And I think that this is something that needs to be done. At the uh, uh, African level, we have the African Charter that protects all Africans, right. including women. And we even have a special protocol, the Maputo Protocol, which is basically to protect women. And it has very, very good provisions with regards to protecting women against violence, domestic violence, and also violence generally that women experience. But many countries have not ratified the Maputo Protocol. A lot of countries have not magnified what they have in the general criminal law to deal specifically with domestic violence. Right. Yeah. O on a local level, though, I mean, I I if someone were to face a, a situation such as that, on a local level, yeah. where would they seek redress? Well, uh, Kenya, uh, we are lucky that we have the Sexual Offences Act, which is uh, much better than what we had before, just the penal code. And if such a thing happened, obviously, you'd be expected to report to the police. And the police, a lot of police stations in Kenya claim that they have gender-based violence desks. Whether or not those desks work as they should is a question that uh, we cannot really answer exhaustively. But what you'd expect in, sit in such a situation is to have a very holistic approach at the police station. Because when such a thing happens, the first thing that a victim of crime would do is to go to the police. So we need a system where the police are able to network with the medical uh, personnel, right. with different work, people like social workers who will give in other aspects that a victim of domestic violence or violence generally would require. So it would not just be about the legal solution, but the other support networks that need to be there for this victim to be taken care of. Uh, we often see in Africa, though, that uh, the whole question of domestic violence or gender-based violence is seen more like a private matter, though. Yeah. Are, are we seeing governments, though, putting, enacting the laws or implementing those laws uh, that will ensure that domestic violence is prohibited? I think one of the, one of the predicaments is that even in Kenya, where we have the Sexual Offenses Act, which is quite elaborate, that that view still persists, that if you are a victim of domestic violence, it is a private affair. And therefore, a lot of uh, victims still have the hesitancy of going to report, of engaging the officials who should address these issues. And I think that is where there's need for a lot of work to be done, for people to know that, you know, a crime cannot be private. So people get you know, used to being beaten up, to being exposed to violence. They probably report nothing serious is done. And so at a sub certain point, some of them acquiesce into it. And I think that is the most dangerous thing, when the victim becomes complacent about the violence. What is it, though, that, that has become a hindrance, whether it is in the law or whether it, it, it is uh, within that setting? What is it that is uh, one of the biggest hindrances? I think the, the, the biggest hindrance, in my view, I think is just the, you know, attitudes. What are our attitudes about domestic violence? I think we only get concerned when somebody dies. I don't think we are as concerned when somebody is hospitalized because of 
domestic violence. You know, as long as they recover, it's almost like, well, they recovered. But I think we need to be more outraged about domestic violence. I think there's need for more systems that are responsive and immediate response. We need to actually ca have uh, even financial assistance because a lot of domestic violence happens in a power relationship. So especially women who are of a lower income uh, level than their spouses. So if your spouse is beating you up, he's the income generator, is the, you know, the house belongs to him, everything belongs to him. How do you complain against him and where do you go after you have complained? So I think there's need to be more systems that protect the victim so that the victim can actually feel free and uh, can happily go and report knowing that they will be protected. They can be put in a shelter. They don't have to interact with the violator. As long as they still have to relate with the violator, I think it's very difficult for them to... Uh, to sincerely to go on with the process, report, go to courts and give evidence. It's, it's a tough calling. All right. And now the Oscar Pistorius trial has been watched uh, yeah. very closely across the continent. Is it likely, though, the verdict of it all, is it likely to have any impact at all on the way African countries view laws and policies on domestic violence? Well, I think it should. Ideally, it should. And I think uh, this I would say from maybe more from a legal perspective because I think that uh, legal uh, lawyers should actually debate this judgment and uh, come to understand it because it's, it's almost gone against all the principles that as lawyers we know apply in a criminal case. Uh, you know, if your action can lead to a death, then you should be more cautious about what you do. And when somebody shoots four times, it doesn't matter who was on the other side. Even then, that's why even when we talk about the police shooting, we expect a policeman to, to shoot you to disable, not to kill. And I think that this uh, judgment really needs to be discussed, to be analyzed, uh, so that, uh, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a continent, what is our jurisprudence when it comes to these things? Is it because the life that was lost was a woman who happened to have a relationship with this man, and therefore that makes it uh, of a lower level of uh, violence than you'd ordinarily if it was an outright murder, so to say. And I think that is what we really do need to, to discuss as Africa, and we need to now look at our systems. We, I think African countries need to not only ratify, but to domesticate the Maputo Protocol, to domesticate those provisions in the CEDAW that protect women more precisely and that give more support than, uh, than what we have now. And judges have to be trained. The legal you know, prosecutors, I think the South African pro prosecutors did a fantastic job. I doubt that in the other parts of Africa that that kind of uh, meticulous detail that they went into to would happen anywhere else in Africa. And I think we need to question and to interrogate our systems. Would we, for example, in Kenya, in right. Uganda, have the same level of uh, prosecution that we saw in South Africa that was fantastic? All right, uh, Florence Joko, former chair, Kenya National Commission on Human Rights. We leave it there for the moment. But thank you very much for being on this special edition of uh, Talk Africa. Well, it has been an emotional seven months for Oscar Pistorius. But as great Africans have put it, there is no elephant that complains about the weight of its own trunk. We'll leave it there on this special edition, but thank you very much for joining us on this special program. I'm Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi.